Hi, Salim. Hello, Guy. Nice to have you with us uh, today. Let me introduce uh, to you uh, Salil Aroska. He's the uh, lead of the cyber risk management at uh, Asina Health Company, which is a healthcare IT company. And uh, we have in previous videos uh, introduced uh, Salil and uh, have, he has shared with us uh, his uh, his uh, career. Salil is based in Bangalore, India, so uh, also interesting from uh, that uh, angle. And we're concentrating ourselves on third-party risk management and we have done a part one where we look at uh, incidents related to third parties and uh, we try to understand uh, the risks uh, which are typically associated with a third party. And uh, today uh, we will continue by looking in more depth of uh, how to organize, what processes we have to set up uh, to manage the risk related to a third party. Again, uh, Salil, thanks so much uh, for being with us and uh, uh, over to you. My pleasure. Um, yeah, so uh, we briefly touched upon it in previous videos where we did mention that our relationship with third parties or partners are really important, but simultaneously when we are talking about the process of the third party management, our relationship as an information security teams or groups, relationship with the business owners, as well as with the teams uh, who deal with the uh, vendor, right? the procurement team on the vendor management team, that relationship is extremely important. That is because the first step of a third party management process would always be how do we screen our potential third parties or potential vendors, right? We need to understand the business objective, what are we sharing with the vendor, what is the vendor uh, being bought in for, and understand what can be the potential risk um, if you bring in such vendor. And that's where we try to, at the screening stage itself, we try to classify the vendors in terms of critical risk, high risk, medium risk, right? And some guideline uh, would always be there in terms of if we are sharing sensitive information to our vendors, it will definitely be either critical or high. Right. And then the next step would be in terms of uh, if we have our legal uh, partners or if we have uh, marketing partners, right, they would slightly come down in the next year risk. Whereas the last year would be the um, less risk where we are talking about landscaping vendors who will really help uh, in maintaining your office or physical security vendors who may have physical access to your premises. So the whole first step is of screening to, uh, to understand what business we are doing with the vendor and try to classify the vendor. And then it smoothly flows into the second step of assessing the vendor for its security practices, trying to understand if I share my premises or if I share my information with the vendor or if I open my premises to the vendor to come in, what risk I'm dealing with. So the assessments can happen in numerous ways, right? Uh, the usual ways that has been happening is through either sending security questionnaire and getting a response to them. So if you see uh, this process may work, but if this process we want to continue for the critical or high risk vendors, we may need to slightly fine tune this process, understand the history of the vendor, understand the business that we are dealing with and try to send focus questionnaires instead of lengthy uh, questionnaires to them, right? Uh, um, that is where may, the first step itself may be challenging in getting the response to the questionnaire. But if we send a very focused questionnaires, if short questionnaire to the vendors, they would respond very proactively, right? The second step is the second part, I would say, apart from sending questionnaires, you may decide based on the response whether uh, it is really required to do a physical visit and assess the vendors. Do you, do you assume that the screening or the assessment are happening as a kind of due diligence before we go into contractual relationship or is that something which comes afterwards? Ideally it should be done uh, before the contracting. Now, so we can for... give an advice to the procurement or we can give an advice uh, to uh, the, the the business owner, if I may say, uh, to positive or negative in terms of uh, actually engaging the vendor. That that's the best case, I assume. 
That's right. Yeah. And uh, we need to engage the business owner and the procurement or the vendor management needs throughout the life cycle. Right? Uh, in fact, uh, we may have to train the business owner to let them know saying what are the risks that we are living with. And so first is always screening. The second step is assessment. Both these steps would come before we actually sign the contracts with the vendor right? or before we onboard the vendor to our ecosystem. I would I would say that uh, as a security yeah. team, you you want you know if you are in a company which has the luxury of having a procurement department, yeah, then the different uh, buyers in the procurement department uh, should be your best friend. <laughs> uh, you should have a close relationship uh, so that you know what's coming your way because you're not just drop everything into a third party risk assessment. You need to know what's coming and so you allocate resources and time uh, to do it. And obviously uh, uh, you have to have, a, a, I would think, a trust relationship with those people the way if you give an opinion, uh, they will uh, take it to, into account. And if they are generally very professional, they, they I'm sure they, they could relate easily uh, to that. But some companies do not have procurement departments. Uh, so uh, I guess, uh, and I would like to have your opinion, then as a, a security team, we have to work with, I guess, line management at large. Uh, uh, is that, uh, you know, that is a little bit harder. Procurement is a finite number of professional people. The business line management could be uh, a, a lot more. And I, I certainly always encourage people to consider once a company has a certain size to have a procurement because the, you can do a better process, you can do a lot of cost savings. Uh, so any advice for anybody who has uh, no uh, no procurement department? Yeah, uh, if, we, if we don't have a procurement department itself, you would see that the businesses or the line management directly approaching you, you as in the information security team and uh, asking for reviews or views on the vendor, right? And that is where the relationship with the business or relationship with the line management would really help. Uh, it is about training or educating our line management in terms of what would be the issues that we would be dealing with in future. Right? So I think if we train them, if we educate them, I think they would be definitely uh, receptive to all our training, all our issues that we highlight. I think one, one point I would like you to take on, on board also when we do the uh, review the assessment aspect is, uh, you know, there, there may be a third party who is doing very specific work for one business owner and it's very well delimited what they do and uh, the assessment can be very clear. Uh, I, I found it very more challenging if you have a third party who is a shared among different business owners and shared without actually having one business owner. They are only used for six months by someone. I remember one which was doing marketing data processing, yeah, uh, and they was used by everybody, uh, but they were not, they didn't have a lead business owner. So I think, uh, and so nobody had to complete view. Everybody only had a little limited view. I think uh, the Maybe you can uh, say a few things in the assessment, how to approach uh, shared uh, third parties versus uh, more uh, specific or delimited uh, third parties. That's where we work with the third party directly. Third parties would generally have account manager or a contact person that would deal with a specific company. Right? And, uh, and this is where we have to deal with the third party directly to understand uh, the scope that they are providing to our services and try to uh, focus our assessments for specific areas. Instead of doing general assessment, you're not going to get a good response. And if we focus our assessment on specific areas, that would really reduce the time and add value to the whole process. I, I assume then also uh, the one is shared, maybe you can a little bit look into shared uh, ownership or shared, not, it's not even shared ownership, it's shared third party. I think the other one, which is, you know, as third parties become popular, they not, you have cases where the third party outsource to third party. 
uh, a number of activities. Maybe he's doing one thing and there is a bit of manual work to be done and he uses uh, another third party. Yeah? So it's, uh, that's why people talk about third and uh, fourth uh, party. party. And we, we can talk a bit uh, later. I mean, that's why you have even uh, tools like a, a security scorecard, which, which evaluates those third parties to the limit of the data being available and uh, look at the third and uh, fourth uh, party. So it is a cascade in, in some sense. But uh, what would be the important uh, things to take into account when you plan uh, an assessment? Um, so when we plan an assessment, we definitely need to do what is the scope that the customer is delivering and the vendor is delivering for that matter. And what the scope has been subcontracted uh, to fourth party or nth parties that you talk about, right? Uh, we have to ensure um, that the clauses are very clear in the contracts, that the third parties are responsible irrespective of whether uh, they are further outsourcing or further subcontracting it to different companies, right? Because at the end of the day, we as a company are responsible for everything. And we are transferring that risk to a third party and that third party is responsible, further responsible for managing that risk. Or as you briefly mentioned, right, it's very important. So one part can be at this in contracting and later when we are Working with the vendor itself, right, in the monitoring phase, if I may uh, say it, right, we try to continuously monitor the vendor using tools in terms of where are the connections coming in from, uh, what is the risk that they're looking at, what are the active threats that are happening. So uh, continuous monitoring will definitely help to identify and manage the risks. Mm -hmm. So if you go maybe before that, we, we also have, we, we have done the assessment and I have one more question on that and then we maybe have to look at we, we have given the green light and uh, we now have to onboard them and what, what to do. But uh, I, I think uh, on, the, um, on, on the assessment, I think, you know, when you have many uh, third parties, if you have a few, it's kind of uh, a bit easier. But when you have many, you suddenly have to have a way to prioritize or to classify or to decide, you know, which one is more risky. Uh, because it's bigger, because the impact could be bigger. Some people use BIAs or other 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 things to classify uh, their third parties. So how how would you approach that so that we know? Okay, we have a hundred, and uh, you know there is in the in the top tier there is a ten, and then the next tier there is a twenty-five or something like that. Because as you said, we we have onboarding, but even the monitoring, we know that the the ones which are higher, we have to monitor more more closely. Uh, what would be a typical way to, uh, let's say, classify them or rank them? Maybe that's a better word. Yeah, I think uh, in terms of ranking and categorizing, you know, it would come slightly in the earlier stages. Firstly, uh, the factors that would come in terms of what are you sharing with them. Right? Uh, if you're sharing sensitive information, they would be critical and uh, it would require close monitoring and I would consider them as high risk windows. Uh, but uh, simultaneously, if we are outsourcing a critical uh, business process with the vendor, whereas if the vendor goes belly up, uh, our processes would be impacted, right? So yes, if we have business impact analysis is important along with uh, risk assessment to identify what kind of information we are sharing with the company, what is our risk exposure, and also to understand what is our exposure to business continuity as such. What would you, uh, I mean, you know, uh, we're as security people, we are busy. Uh, we're always busy. We always get busier. Yeah. So we, we tend to, and you mentioned that before, tend to send out questionnaires. It's just send me, it give me your answers. And then, you know, uh, even there, we could do a whole show on what can go wrong on the questionnaire. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it can be, the vendor asks every question by yes or no. Yeah, it's kind of at the end, you know, it's uh, you, you don't feel confident. Or uh, sometimes uh, when the questionnaire is not well done, uh, the question implies the answer. Do you have a firewall? Well, what's the answer to that question? <laughs> so uh, designing the questionnaire in a good way is, is important. 
Some people say you should have an interview and not just uh, send it by mail and then give an answer back. Uh, some people say that you, in some cases, when possible, you should, and you mentioned that before, you should go on site and see by yourself because everybody can answer the questionnaire, everybody can have a nice website. But when you are in the premises of a third party, you have suddenly a very different view uh, of it because uh, now that the inner shell, the outer shell, you can see that the website, the questionnaires, the contacts, the telephone calls, who knows. But when you go on site, you see, okay, what is the reality of the third party? What are your views on, on, on questionnaires and physical, uh, physical visits? Yeah, I, I briefly touched upon in the first part of the screening, right? Um, as you also rightly mentioned, if you just send out lengthy questionnaires, before then getting the response to the questionnaire itself is pretty huge. So uh, definitely we need to automate the process, right? And as much as possible, we need to send out focused questionnaires, right? Or a specific service. Uh, for example, in some cases, a yes or no question is good. But in some cases, if it is yes, please expand on it, right? So we, we need to ask focused questions at least for critical or um, high risk vendors, uh, not send them a general questionnaire. Right? And secondly, uh, physical visits uh, also help us not just to assess the security posture of a company, but the physical visits also help us to build relationship with the third party vendors, which is really important in the long run. It's not about um, auditing the company, it's about uh, assessing the company whether we uh, we would be able to run the our business successfully if we outsource this particular business process to you. Uh, when I was uh, CISO on the sunny side globally in Singapore, I my one of my uh, instructions because we have many 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 was that uh, at the beginning of the questionnaire we had uh, the business case what is our company doing with that uh, vendor and so forth and also i instructed everybody to collect data about the society where is their location uh, if they have an organization chart uh, what does their business report so and to, uh, even to take a few pictures because my instruction was you know if you are the assessor, you are very close to the third party and you, you write down a few things. But if two years later, someone else comes, which is not you, you know, and he reads the report and you have only summarized what you have done, he cannot imagine uh, what you have seen and he cannot maybe reproduce your, your conclusion at the end uh, because simply you have, only, you have only given the conclusion but not the logic or the facts uh, you have given. And I think that is a, a very uh, important part is to not only document uh, security things but in general, like with the physical visits, you know, organization charts, business information and, and so on, yeah, and, and so forth, yeah. And also, uh, but uh, I think one has also to be a little bit uh, neutral. I have seen... Uh, 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 third parties were, you know, which, which are staying in very strange buildings, but are excellent companies, yeah? So sometimes we have to, we're a little bit biased, yeah? We say, oh, what's going on here? And so forth, yeah? But uh, let's assume we, we give the green light. So uh, the next step is the onboarding. What, what, what is important uh, when, uh, when we do that? I think in terms of onboarding, I think uh, this is where all the contracting and SLEs are defined and signed. So all the contracts and SLEs should be very clear in terms of what are the responsibilities of the third party, what are the responsibilities of the organization, and uh, everything should be defined, not just from a risk perspective, also from laws and regulation perspective. We still have to work within the laws and regulations that uh, we have to. And we have to ensure that uh, the contracts also uh, talk in the same language, right? And this is where the onboarding would come into picture. I, I briefly mentioned we have to definitely train the vendors about the specific, uh, train the business owner rather about the specific vendor. Uh, we definitely need to uh, have agreement of the contract in terms of sharing data. Uh, whenever an incident happens. So uh, incident response is a very critical thing that we may need to add in a contract where, where if, if and when more things happen, uh, we should be able to share data seamlessly uh, within the two organizations. And third is definitely uh, we need to ensure the 
service delivery in terms of what is the resiliency of the company, whether they would, what is the uptime they would provide, and what are the measures that uh, they would have in place to protect our information. So all these stuff should go in the contract, right? And simultaneously, when we do a risk assessment uh, before the stage, and if we identify that in a lot of cases where we identified that like, this vendor is a very niche vendor and there is no other competitor which will provide the service. So we may not have an option but to go with the vendor. But in this case, if we have identified some issues during our risk assessment, it is worth adding these risks in the contract agenda, saying that these are the risks we identified and we the vendor should be responsible for fixing these risks. Right? So there should be a two-way talk between the assessment and the onboarding phase as well, where we sell the contracts and SLAs. Yeah. I think it's a good point. Uh, so basically preventive measures take into account then uh, incident response uh, being uh, clearly defined because we cannot avoid everything. And if we're hit in some ways, uh, put in the resilience, how do we ge get uh, back on our feet? I would add and, and putting those in the contract, I, I would say you know, I sometimes have been worried about some vendors want our business and they're willing to sign everything. So we have to be a little bit careful. Uh, someone says, uh, are, you, are you okay with this? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Because all they are thinking about the money they're going to make at the end. Uh, so we have to be uh, always uh, sure that they, they are serious about uh, the contract, I think, uh, or they are going to be executing in, this, in a good way. Uh, what we put uh, there so uh, yeah okay so uh, now uh, uh, we we did the assessment we have the onboarding uh, are there uh, are there you know there, there may be still a, a few risks which we accepted somewhere uh, because not everything is beautiful and we know we, we know they're finding the very perfect third party it may not be possible uh, so we 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 accept a certain risk, I guess. So how 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 do how do you what do you recommend on 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 managing that remaining risk or residual risk? Yeah, I think uh, we made a good point, right? Um, as I briefly mentioned earlier, we may not have an option but to go with a vendor, and in some cases, uh, because of these reasons, we may have to accept a risk. But while accepting a risk, uh, we need to understand what are security controls around it, how we are trying to minimize our exposure in various scenarios. It can also uh, try to communicate the risk to the business owner or, and explain him or her and what the risk we are living with. And uh, also ensure that this risk is uh, again uh, documented somewhere, create a risk database. Um, as you briefly mentioned, create a risk database, uh, record the risk and then uh, keep a track of all these risks uh, and how they are mitigating this risk or how they are controlling this risk uh, by doing regular reviews uh, with the vendor uh, when they are after the contract is signed rather. Yeah, so accepting risk is a, is a reality. You cannot run away with it. But ensure that these risks are documented uh, in the contract. It ties back to the contract and uh, yeah, we keep track of it. I think uh, also, uh, at least, and I would like your opinion on that, uh, uh, the, the environment has changed in the sense that, you know, in the old days, we did only the risk assessment at the beginning and they, okay, you get the green light, go, okay, today, you know, you mentioned so many times already that we have to monitor, we have an initial assessment, but you have to continue what has changed because I've seen if the third parties are doing well, sometimes the scope of what they do extend, expands beyond the initial scope. Uh, or the third party may be acquired by another third party or the environment is in and also we you know we have more sources these days you know uh, there's a number of uh, risk assessment companies like i mentioned before uh, security scorecard as one but there are others who allow us to monitor what's happening because we cannot monitor every minute uh, what's happening there are those who monitor also uh, Darknet data, if a lot of uh, data is uh, available from the third party on the dark web, then uh, it means that uh, there is a security problem out there. So we have also more sources, but if we ingest those sources, I think then we come to uh, what you mentioned before uh, in, in terms of uh, monitoring. Yeah? 
I think uh, can can you can you maybe expand a bit on on the on the monitoring? Yeah. Is that is that yeah. I mean, is uh, that continuous monitoring or is that like every six months or yearly or how or depends on the third party? How, how what what's your approach there? Apart from continuous monitoring, we also need to tie in our threat intel um, to help focus our um, energies into the top. 10 risks, right, or top 10 threats that can actually happen, or top 10 exploits that are really happening in the wide, right? Um, so, time threat intel, time uh, continuous monitoring, and time continuous monitoring through tools. And also, um, in some cases, you mentioned we may expand the scope of a third party, right, um, in between. So, it may make sense if there is an incident out there in the wild, like, for example, uh, take a target incident. If there was a target incident, I would expect uh, a vendor, a similar vendor um, like Walmart or anybody to do a assessment through vendors to check whether our vendors are impacted by a similar kind of attack or the kind of threat. So uh, maybe a focused risk assessment based on whatever is happening in uh, our threat landscape will also help apart from regular reviews. I think uh, for regular reviews are also definitely helpful, but that can be done for a lower risk vendor. But for high risk vendor, we definitely do need to do continuous monitoring. In, uh, before we go to, I mean, this is uh, onboarding, running, and uh, you know, continuously monitoring. Uh, and also we will have to talk a bit about the offboarding in a minute, but uh, any any guess if I have a, if I'm the CISO and this is part of my risk management team and the risk management may have to deal with third parties uh, projects other things yeah it seems to me that the risk management function these days may be between I would say 10 to 20 percent of the whole uh, security budget in, in as a total yeah well, of course you have a infrastructure security, cloud security, uh, SOC, and so there are many others. But it's not 5%. Uh, it is, uh, and, and growing a bit, yeah, because uh, I think the risk which moves to third party, and I would even more generalize, the risk who move to the business, and not just IT, is increasing. And uh, uh, the, the ones who are really dealing with that risk is the risk management team. So I, 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 I would, give a number or a range between 10 and 20% of the whole budget uh, might be uh, related to risk management large and from that a substantial part to uh, third parties. Is that the number which you can relate to or make sense to you? Yeah, we can definitely relate to it. Um, as we talk about uh, all the risks or threats or all the laws and regulations that are coming up, Definitely the investment in risk management, peer risk management is in, in increasing a lot, right? As we talk to the business, they also realize the third party risk that is coming up. And that's why we do get a uh, lot of support for managing the third party risk as well. So yeah, it is around 10 to 20% depending on how big a company you are. All right, but um, yeah, I think uh, along with people, we definitely need um, some kind of tools and automation to manage all the risks in the organization. I think this is uh, come back to our discussion before, how, how to, on the, we have two dimensions. On the one side, you want on-site good questionnaire, focus questionnaire, so you focus on quality. Uh, on the other hand, you know, uh, you have so many. Uh, you have to have a, a productivity concept almost <laughs> to actually, how many can you process otherwise? Uh, uh, you are always uh, behind and uh, I think uh, also uh, not only do you have to do the assessment but you have to follow up the open items and, and so forth so uh, I think having automation having a good tool is important and maybe in, in a future video we can talk about the tooling uh, which is necessary to achieve both the quality and, and also the productivity or the performance a part of it. But maybe uh, to finish the process part, any uh, could you share a few uh, important things about the offboarding? Uh, so let's assume that our, our relationship is uh, coming to an end. Now uh, we we have shared so much information on both sides. 
how does offboarding uh, uh, go? Let me add one one point before you uh, go in details. You know, there is a, a variation. Yeah, uh, if I sell a part of my company, it was part of me or my company before, and when we sell it, it becomes a third party. <laughs> then the offboarding is a is a huge thing. <laughs> Uh, I have been involved in a few uh, sales of factories. It's like you cut off your arm and then you see there is so many blood vessels and nerves and everything going. So I think maybe you can also talk in generally about the third party then maybe a few words on, on uh, actually uh, offboarding uh, part of the business and not just a third party which has been a bit separate from the beginning. Yeah, I think uh, offboarding is very critical but often ignored in the whole uh, information security cycle or the whole vendor management cycle, you know, I would say. Right? Uh, offboarding has to be tied back to the first, uh, third stage of contracting. We need to be very clear in terms of what are, what would be the offboarding terms like data erasure, uh, removing the access, uh, and showing, sharing the evidences of data erasure or for that matter, uh, is from the hard disk and these evidence should be stored for all the future purposes. So all these um, things, the offboarding process itself should be documented in the contract uh, earlier itself, right? And we ensure that we stick to the steps mentioned in the contract and we capture the evidences and store it. Uh, secondly, there are certain risks that we are talking about saying that maybe only one business uh, is offboarding from the vendor whereas other businesses also um, other businesses still using it right so we need to be careful what does offboarding mean offboarding may mean not just from home business but it's completely off from the organization and that's where access removing the access becomes very critical and that's where i want to take up your point in terms of if we are having off a certain part of uh, my organization and that hyped off organization becomes a third party to us. We have to be very careful in removing the access that the employees, erstwhile employees had, and then onboarding the access as part of third parties. I think we need to be very clear on that. So, but I would still categorize that into merger and acquisition stuff, which is a different topic altogether. Right. Uh, with this discussion, we can focus on just offboarding of third parties or offboarding as vendors, right? As I mentioned, um, sticking to the contracts that we have and ensuring we collect the evidences, ensuring we uh, have um, all the evidences stored and as much as possible, um, we end up on a good relationship because we, you never know, we may start using that vendor in future as well. Super. Well, I think uh, uh, that uh, covers a bit our the, our overview of uh, let's say the more the, the key stages or process part. Uh, clearly, uh, that should give everybody a sense of the amount of work <laughs> which is involved, and uh, also the sometimes uh, the prioritization or uh, smart trade-offs we have to do to. To get our our, our job done, and uh, yes, uh, we'll we'll have uh, still a part to cover in terms of uh, other aspects like the special cases of merger and acquisition in a moment. But uh, uh, so uh, please uh, stay uh, tuned uh, also to that uh, part. Yep. Um, yeah. Third party is a third party risk management is a huge thing, and yeah, we can discuss in future in terms of merger and acquisition itself is a different ball game altogether. Managing contract staffs is again a different ball game altogether. You really do go with third party risk. So, in the meantime, uh, thanks uh, uh, Salil for having given us this very detailed insight and also this uh, recommendation. I think obviously every every company, every case, every degree of maturity, every scale is different, but I think we try to cover at least the best practices in terms of uh, general approach uh, to this and obviously. Uh, more than happy if uh, anybody would like to leave some comments in the comment section about uh, other aspects of it which are important to your business or which are resulting uh, from your experience. So uh, uh, thanks for that also. And again, thanks Salil for, for sharing uh, your insight. Thank you so much. 
and cheer. God bless.